Hi there, I am Mahohori Wampela Makane, and I am one of the co-founders of Love is a Kind of Cure, along with my partner in crime, as you well know, um, Clevis Natera. We are so thrilled to be hosting this 50th year anniversary celebration of, drumroll please, only the baddest, the best, and the most epic, the bluest eye. Toni Morrison's debut novel and it just feels so delicious and beautiful on a ridiculously gorgeous fall day here in the Northeast to be celebrating as Kamala Harris has been announced the new Vice President of the United States of America. It is a huge day and moment and year and century for black girlhood not just for black girls, but honestly, this is a huge moment for Indian girls in her own village, um, for every kind of woman who finally gets to recognize somebody that looks like them. And for, and for the millions of Pecolas who will now have somebody to look up to when they turn on the news, who confirms their beauty and their humanity, right? Um, I'm here to share the after word um, that Toni Morrison really beautifully put at the end of The Bluest Eye. And I will read it and at the end I'll share some brief reflections and um, also a small word of love for Pecola. Thanks. We had just started elementary school. She said she wanted blue eyes. I looked around to picture her with them and was violently repelled by what I imagined she would look like if she had her wish. The sorrow in her face seemed to call for sympathy and I faked it for her but astonished by the desecration she proposed I got mad at her instead. Until that moment, I had seen the pretty, the lovely, the nice, the ugly, and although I had certainly used the word beautiful, I had never experienced its shock, the force of which was equaled by the knowledge that no one else recognized it, not even, or especially, the one who possessed it. It must have been more than the face I was examining. The silence of the street in the early afternoon, the light, the atmosphere of confession. In any case, it was the first time I knew beautiful, had imagined it for myself. Beauty was not simply something to behold. It was something one could do. The bluest eye was my effort to say something about that, to say something about why she had not or possibly ever would have the experience of what she possessed and also why she prayed for so radical an alteration. Implicit in her desire was racial self-loathing. And 20 years later, I was still wondering about how one learns that. Who told her? Who made her feel that it was better to be a freak than to be what she was? Who had looked at her and found her so wanting, so small a weight on the beauty scale? The novel pecks away 
at the gaze that condemned her. The reclamation of racial beauty in the 60s stirred these thoughts, made me think about the necessity of reclaim. Why, although reviled by others, could this beauty not be taken for granted within the community? Why did it need wide public articulation to exist? These aren't clever questions, but in 1962, when I began the story, and in 1965, when it began to be a book, the answers were not as obvious to me as they quickly became and are now. The assertion of racial beauty was not a reaction to the self-mocking, humorous critique of cultural racial foibles common in all groups, but against the damaging internalization of assumptions of immutable inferiority originating in an outside gaze. I focused, therefore, on how something as grotesque as the demonization of an entire race could take root inside the most delicate member of society, a child, the most vulnerable member, a female. In trying to dramatize the devastation that even casual racial contempt can cause, I chose a unique situation, not a representative one. The extremity of Pakola's case stemmed largely from a crippled and crippling family, unlike the average black family and unlike the narrators. But singular as Pakola's life was, I believed some aspects of her woundability were lodged in all young girls. In exploring the social and domestic aggression that could cause a child to literally fall apart, I mounted a series of rejections, some routine, some exceptional, some monstrous, all the while trying hard to avoid complicity in the demonization process Pakola was subjected to. That is, I didn't want to dehumanize the characters who trashed Pakola and contributed to her collapse. One problem was centering. The weight of the novelty's inquiry on so delicate and vulnerable a character could smash her and lead readers into the comfort of pitying her rather than into the interrogation of themselves for the smashing. My solution, break the narrative into parts that had to be reassembled by the reader, seemed to me a good idea, the execution of which does not satisfy me now. Besides, it didn't work. Many readers remain touched, but not moved. The other problem, of course, was language. Holding the despising glance while sabotaging it was difficult. The novel tried to hit the raw nerve of racial self-contempt, expose it, then soothe it, not with narcotics, but with language that replicated the agency I discovered in my first experience of beauty. Because that moment was so racially infused, my revulsion at what my school friend wanted, very blue eyes and a very black skin, the harm she was doing to my self-contempt, to my concept of the beautiful. The struggle was for writing that was indisputably black. I don't yet know what this is, but rather that, but neither that nor the attempts to disqualify an effort 
to find out keeps me from trying to pursue it. Some time ago, I did the best job I could of describing strategies for grounding my work in race-specific yet race-free prose. Prose free of racial hierarchy and triumphalism. Parts of that description are as follows. The opening phrase of the first sentence, quiet as it's kept, had several attractions for me. First, it was a familiar phrase, familiar to me as a child listening to adults, to black women conversing with one another, telling a story, an anecdote, gossip about some one or other event within the circle, the family, the neighborhood. The words are conspirational. Shh, don't tell anyone else. And no one is allowed to know this. It is a secret between us and a secret that is kept from us. The conspiracy is both held and withheld, exposed and sustained. In some sense, it was precisely what the act of writing this book was, the public exposure of a private confidence. In order to comprehend fully the duality of that position, one needs to be reminded of the political climate in which the writing took place, 1950, 1965 to 1969, a time of great social upheaval in the lives of black people. The publication, as opposed to the writing, involved the exposure. The writing was the disclosure of secrets, secrets we shared and those withheld from us by ourselves and by the world outside the community. Quiet as it's kept is also a figure of speech that is written in this instance, but clearly chosen for how speakerly it is, how it speaks and bespeaks a particular world and its ambience. Further, in addition to its back fence connotation of thrilling revelation, there is also in the whisper the assumption on the part of the reader that the teller is on the inside, knows something others do not, and is going to be generous with this privileged information. The intimacy I was aiming for the intimacy between the reader and the page could start up immediately because the secret is being shared at best and eavesdropping upon at the very least. Sudden familiarity or instant intimacy seemed crucial to me. I did not want the reader to have time to wonder, what do I have to do to give it up in order to read this? What defense do I need? What distance should I maintain? Because I know, and the reader does not, he or she has to wait for the second sentence, that this is a terrible story about things one would rather not know anything about. What then is the big secret about to be shared? The thing we the reader and I are in on, what is it? A botanical aberration, pollution perhaps, a skip perhaps in the natural order of things, a September, an autumn, a fall without marigolds, bright, common, strong and sturdy marigolds. When? In 1941. And since that is a momentous year, the beginning of World War II for the United States, the fall of 1941, just before the declaration of war, has a closet innuendo. 
in the temperature zone where there is a season known as fall during which one expects marigolds to be at their peak in the month before the beginning of U.S. participation in World War II. Something grim is about to be divulged. The next sentence will make it clear that the year, the one, the sayer, the next sentence will make it clear that the sayer, the one who knows, is a child speaking, mimicking, The next sentence will make it clear that the sayer, the one who knows, is a child speaking, mimicking the adult black woman on the porch or in the backyard. The opening phrase is an effort to be grown up about the shocking information. The point of view of a child alters the priority an adult would assign the information. We thought it was because Pecola was having her father's baby that the marigolds did not grow. Foregrounds the flowers, backgrounds, illicit, traumatic, incomprehensible sex coming into its dreaded fruition. This foregrounding of trivial information and backgrounding of shocking knowledge secures the point of view but gives the reader pause about whether the voice of children can be trusted at all or is more trustworthy than an adult's. The reader is thereby protected from a confrontation too soon with the painful details, while simultaneously provoked into a desire to know them. The novelty, I thought, would be in having the story of female violation revealed from the vantage point of the victims, or could be victims, of rape. The persons no one inquired of, at least certainly not in 1965, the girls themselves. And since the victim does not have the vocabulary to understand the violence or its context, gullible, vulnerable girlfriends. Looking back, as the knowing adults they pretended to be in the beginning, would have to do that for her and would have to fill those silences with her own reflective lives. Thus, the opening provides the stroke that announces something more than a sacred, shared, but a silent, broken, a void filled, an unspeakable thing spoken at last. And it draws the connection between a minor destabilization in seasonal flora and the insignificant destruction of a black girl. Of course, Minor and insignificant represent the outside world's view. For the girls, both phenomena are earth-shaking depositories of information they spend that whole year of childhood and afterward trying to fathom and cannot. If they have any success, it will be in transferring the problem of fathoming to the presumably adult reader, to the inner circle of listeners. At the least, they have distributed the weight of these problematic questions to a larger constituency and justified the public exposure of a privacy. If the conspiracy that the opening words announced is entered into by the reader, then the book can be seen to open with its close a speculation on the disruption of nature as being a social disruption with tragic individual consequences in which the reader, as part of the population of the text, is implicated. However, 
A problem lies in the central chamber of the novel. The shattered world I built. To, to complement what is happening to Pakola. Its pieces held together by seasons in child time and commenting at every turn on the incompatible and barren white family primer does not in its present form handle effectively the silence at its center, the void that is Pecola's unbeing. It should have a shape like the emptiness left by a boom or a cry. It required a sophistication unavailable to me and some deft manipulation of the voices around her. She is not seen by herself until she hallucinates herself. And the fact of her hallucination becomes a kind of outside the book conversation. Also, though I was pressing for a female expressiveness, it eluded me for the most part. And I had to content myself with female persona because I was not able to secure throughout the work the feminine subtext that is present in the opening sentence, a woman gossiping, eager and aghast. Right, that's cute. The shambles this struggle became is most evident in the section on Pauline, Breed Love, where I resorted to two voices, hers and the urging narrators, both of which are extremely unsatisfactory to me. It is interesting to me now that where I thought I would have the most difficulty subverting the language to a feminine mode, I had the least connecting Charlie's rape by the white men to his own of his daughter. The most masculine act of aggression becomes feminized in my language, passive, and I think more accurately repellent when derived, when deprived of the male glamour of shame. Rape is routinely or once was given. My choices of language, speakerly, oral, colloquial, my reliance for full comprehension on codes embedded in black culture, my effort to effect immediate co-conspiracy and intimacy without any distancing explanatory fabric, as well as my attempt to shape a silence while breaking it, are attempts to transfigure the complexity and wealth of black American culture into a language worthy of the culture. Thinking back now on the problems expressive language presented to me, I am amazed by their currency, their tenacity. Hearing civilized languages debase humans, watching cultural exorcisms debase literature, seeing oneself preserved in the amber of disqualifying metaphors. I can say that my narrative project is as difficult today as it was 30 years ago. With very few expectations, the initial publication of The Bluest Eye was like Pecola's life. Dismissed, trivialized, misread. And it has taken 25 years to gain for her the respectful publication this edition is. Princeton, New Jersey, November 1993, Toni Morrison. <sighs> wow. Um, you know, I think about the bravery and the courage of Toni Morrison, 50 years ago, daring to do what hadn't been done before, to imagine herself on the page and to give young black girls and 
honestly, any girl who is at the margins, that far out, the margins of society, right? To give that, that person the humanity that they not only deserve, but that they are deeply in conversation with behind closed doors and privately in their own inner life. Um, to dare to say that this is number one worthy and this is number two, the stuff of literature and requires serious attention. It's so humbling and it's so inspiring and it also speaks so desperately to this moment where we're holding these two juxtaposing realities and truths in 2020, right? Breonna Taylor is no more in the physical form that happened this year. And Kamala Harris is stepping into the vice presidential seat as the first woman ever to be elected. What do those two truths mean? And I think in this afterward, Toni Morrison gives us a way forward and helps us understand the way in which um, that act of bravery, of being willing to see ourselves as we are completely, everything that makes us beautiful and what is also tired and scary and the worst, the most debased elements of us. Um, sitting with that is maybe the most important thing that we can do. Maybe that is how we give Pecola what she never could have on the page, right? A sense of love and um, tethering her to a place in the world that loves her as she is and not as she perverts herself to want to be so she could be good enough. Um, if there's any words of love and encouragement I could offer Pecola, especially today, it's to know that these two dueling truths for what black womanhood is are true. Brianna Taylor still deserves justice and is still waiting for that justice. And I personally believe that will come if we do the work, if we are loud and persistent. And at the same time, Kamala Harris is the VP. That means we have power. We're not, we're, we're not the pitiable story that Toni Morrison warns us against, right? We have agency and we have each other more than anything else. Um, this book is extremely beautiful. I hope that you have taken in the entire read along and I hope you also revisit it on the page because it really deserves being in the company of a reader who revels in language as clearly Toni Morrison um, so deeply thought about how we would receive the language and what did it mean for her to do justice to these beautiful black and complicated and sometimes ugly black people um, to do justice to them in their culture through the language. I am so delighted that we have put this together and again I hope you visit um, the entirety of the readings, our creatives, our readers, writers, um, huge beautiful hearts and troublemakers have humbled us and we look forward to celebrating this year and also for the next 50 years to come. Toni Morrison, you will always be queen. You are forever reigning. We'll always be reading this book. Thank you. Go! Oh.